Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's webcast about API Governance 2.0, a key element for security and scaling API programs. My name is Raymond Peng, and I'm a digital engagement lead at Google. And I'm also Hi. joined with uh, Ruben Gonzalez. Hi, everyone. I'm a customer engineer for Apigee. Awesome. All right, so before we get started, just a quick few housekeeping items. You're going to see on the console uh, in this webcast on the left a place where you can put in your queue and questions and answers. You can post your questions at any time during the webcast. But please note that uh, you don't have to wait until the end of the session. Uh, you can ask at any time, and we'll try to answer them either at the end or offline after the webcast. Also, you'll see a resource list on the right. Uh, we will post some links and other things within the resource that we mentioned during the webcast. So uh, you can access them as well that way. So let's take a quick look at the agenda for today's webcast. The first thing we're going to talk about is a paradigm shift in API governance. So what is this API governance 2.0 all about anyways? Uh, we're also going to start with creating consistent and security API patterns for APIs and how you can use them to ensure adherence and compliance and standards for your APIs. And then we'll show you how Apigee can help you do that. So the software that applies this API governance 2.0 concepts as well as the technology and hopefully, they'll help uh, our audience understand how they can build and test APIs much, much faster than they're doing today. So with that being said, uh, let's take a look at kind of where uh, companies are at. You know, A lot of companies have invested in APIs. They might have hundreds or even thousands of APIs. And uh, those who have them are, are primarily started with uh, this integration method, basically APIs that we're calling system to system. But you know, with digital disruption, Ruben, you know, so many things have happened in terms of the emergence of cloud, you know, the changing power of the consumer and the emergence of new competitive threats for a lot of different companies in terms of other crossovers that are trying to eat their business away. So, you know, now companies are starting to use the APIs in a much more expansive way. They are integrating with partners. So they're going external, they're putting them on the cloud and they're using them to monetize and actually find new sources of revenue. So really transformative. But in the end, so now you've got, maybe you had 10 or 100 or 1,000 APIs, but now they were all internal, but now they're also external, right? And so that creates you know, this concern that you have all these APIs you know, in your organization, internal and external, but at the same time, you still got to go fast, and there's that concern about uh, security. So there's sort of this balance, right, in terms of, well, I got to go fast, I'm, I need to be competitive, but how can I get this speed? That's right. So, um, and this, and we, we usually see this happening too often, right? So now organizations are uh, thinking of security as an afterthought rather than something that need to be prioritized, uh, even before thinking of, what, of which capabilities they're going to start exposing through APIs, right? They are getting all this pressure from, the, from their competition. They need to deliver um, as fast as possible. However, um, well, you see, um, there, all these security issues are, being, uh, are not being addressed correctly, and then surprise, now they're being attacked, or now they, uh, they, some uh, malicious user found a vulnerability, and now they're they are, um, using all their data for malicious purposes. So, um, so yeah, this is happening too often. So how, uh, how, did it, uh, how did we come to this place, right? How did we did come to happen? And well, it's, it's pretty simple, right? So organizations, they want, to, they, want, they want to innovate really fast, right? However, it's not as simple as just exposing some digital asset through an API. Yeah, of course, they need to deliver all these new experiences as fast as possible. However, they're still dealing with the same legacy and old systems, right? And uh, some, of, some development teams, they're just exposing services just because they can. Right, they're just building a REST uh, interface on top of their legacy systems, and they're forgetting about setting the right security patterns. Perhaps they're not thinking on how they should be scaling uh, their APIs the right way. Uh, they are losing visibility on who are the real users of those APIs, so that whenever they bring a new uh, a new revision or a new update to their services, they lose control of uh, the updates that they're making to those systems, right? In a sense, uh, they're um, creating this uh, API sprawl environment, right? So they are losing control of what's going on within the API program. Yeah, yeah, it's a real problem. And, um, you know, it's, it's kind of like the more you create APIs, it is a benefit, but it creates lots of different security holes, and especially if you're doing them all differently. And so, you know, a lot of companies are looking at, you know, the typical IT method, which is big G governance. So I'm going to put rules, gates, and enforcements. You know, I'm going to make sure that I'm controlling every little thing and that there's approvals for releases and lots of manual reviews. 
you know, that accompanies with big documents and also a lot of different time spent on aligning and corporate politics. So, you know, this is kind of a problem, Ruben, right? So it's like, you know, we've got all these security concerns, we've got to go fast, but because of that security, now we have this big cop in the middle, right? And that's pretty, that, that can be really detrimental. And so if you look at, you know, from a standpoint, let's say we've got an API team, they, they've already ready to release their APIs or build their APIs, they start out happy, but they get to this first standpoint, which is they have an architecture review. So now that's a speed bump. Then they have to go to API design reviews. Someone has to make sure that they're using the right approach and they're using reusable and making sure they have the right policies in there. Or they have an internal standards review. And then finally, when they go to deploy, there's a whole bunch of checklists that they never were aware of. And so what happens in these four speed bumps? There's tons of rework within the cycle. And so if you're a smart team, you know, you're going to prepare in advance and you're going to get all your documents ready. But you're gonna, this, this process is probably such a headache that you start to bundle all of your APIs together. So rather than getting one approved, I'm gonna put 20 or 30. And so pretty soon we're back to waterfall. The other thing is I know some of the loopholes, I know I have relationships, I know people, and I know what they're kind of looking for, or they know me. So I might just sidestep this process. And in the end, what happens there, we basically, the, the something that we designed to keep us secure is now people have found a loophole and found a path of least resistance. So this is a real bad problem, right? So it looks like there's no good way to solve this, right, Ruben? I mean, I, I think that's the challenge where we are today. I mean, there, there are different uh, ways of we, how we can address this. We, uh, we can see this as a process-driven uh, uh, solution or perhaps uh, making a mix, uh, including as part of the mix, uh, um, the right tool for you to be able to address these issues. Yeah. And so before we get into tools, I think as technologists, you know, we always think about how can we use tools? I think the most important thing that we find with our customers and organizations, it's a really a mindset sh shift first. And so at Apogee, we call API Governance 2.0. And we wrote this manifesto working with hundreds of customers worldwide. And we've seen their programs go uh, grow based on this kind of mindset. And so the first one is really around empowering and enabling over enforcement. Right? How can I help my API teams? Give them the tools, give them knowledge, give them the ability to make decisions. Right? Then the second is guidance and support over policing. The third is accelerating progress over slowing change. So really, it's, it's, it's a dynamic. Right? I, I'm not focused on how can I overturn everything and look at it. I really want to focus on speed. How, what can I do to keep these teams going fast? And last is this relinquishing of a centralized control. So trust and federation over centralized control. And I think trust is not something that you can just basically say, trust me. You have to build trust into your system. So that's the cornerstone, I think, of the mindset change, this manifesto of governance 2.0. And so that really means you know, a lot of teams, they call them API centers of excellence. But what we want people to shift to is this API center of enablement. And so what does that look like? You know, I think really quickly, big G governance versus little g culture. That's really the shift in terms of big G governance to this governance 2.0. That means I'm going from rules, to gates, and enforcements to principles, standards, and empowerment. You know, I used to have top-down design and planning, a big waterfall. Now I have separation of concerns. I have an enterprise concern. I allow teams to do what they need to do. I'm going from approvals for releases to criteria-based and continuous releases. I want to make people to understand what it means to pass go and to hit the criteria so that they can always release constantly at their speed. And I'm not going to do manual and analog processes. I'm going to look at how I can create self-service through automation and tooling. And I'm going to enforce, um, I'm going to enforce community knowledge. Uh, and community documentation rather than centralized work documents. And then the last couple too, you know, I'm going to have cross-functional teams and coaches. I'm not going to have distinct big handovers from teams, which is very core to the way of agile thinking, you know, same thing as governance 2.0. And uh, instead of spending all this time aligning and building corporate politics, I'm going to focus on building tools, CICD, uh, to help the teams go faster so that they're essentially using efficiency-based tools rather than alignment and time spent and wasted meetings and politics. If I have that, I have this API governance 2.0, Ruben. Uh, let's take a look at the process that we have today. Uh, there's four points, API architecture, design, right, standards, and then deployment and, and live. So how can we use technology in this case? How can we apply the principles of API 2.0 uh, to all four of these things? Yeah, can we, can we, let's, let's do that and try to solve this problem together.
Definitely. So from an architecture standpoint, perhaps you might want to look into a, a way to standardize globally and across all your existing architecture. It doesn't matter if they're deployed, if you are deployed in a cloud or multiple cloud providers or even on premises. You want uh, to build a layer of abstraction of top, on top of your existing services so that you can enforce and not only enforce, but decouple common security patterns from your existing system. So for your existing uh, uh, APIs, right? So that you're going to be able to build this layer of abstraction, and 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 essentially this will become a shield that is going to uh, is going to protect both the interactions from your existing API consumers and also the the secure interactions between this platform and your backend systems. By setting up this layer of abstraction, you're going to be able to standardize all your security patterns and make sure that they are enforced correctly. Perfect. So if I'm an API developer. I, de I deploy an API to the API platform, it's automatically, I'm automatically going to gain the benefits of threat protection, the security, and the patterns that you're talking about. So I, I'm essentially kind of deploying on a trusted, uh, trusted platform. That is correct. So per, uh, essentially, you're building secure interactions between your API consumers and your backend systems through a, a standardized uh, shield or layer of abstraction in a plat API platform. What are some of the examples of the patterns that you're talking about, Ruben? Uh, so perhaps from a net network perspective, you're going to be building a trust relationship within the platform and your backend systems. Perhaps you're already using an existing security pattern. So the only thing you need to do is to uh, set up a really simple uh, trust relationship between the API platform and your existing backend systems. Perhaps you, you can build up a very simple neutral TLS setup. Perhaps mm -hmm. if you're looking into uh, token-based uh, authentication mechanisms, that's something you can build up upon. However, if you want to reuse what you already what you already have you can you can do it and then you can keep, keep progressing the, those patterns so that you can start uh, standardizing once new projects come in right okay. and the same story goes on the on the uh, consumer uh, relationship right uh, perhaps your organization might be thinking on setting up OAuth as a standard across the board that's something that you can enforce at this layer perfect perfect so I've got my API management set up now. I've got the security architecture in place. You talked a little bit about OAuth and security. Can you tell me a little bit more about, you now? let's dive in. I've, I've got a couple of APIs. Definitely. So usually uh, from a development standpoint, this is this happens too often, right? Each and every time you have to expose a new service, uh, uh, we developers need to get, get, sometimes get too creative and start setting up new security patterns, so new ways to secure our project or APIs, right? Yeah. And for each and every project, we have to set up that pattern. However, the, uh, the, there's a best way to do it. So once you build this layer of abstraction, perhaps you you can also start decoupling this pattern so that no longer the uh, is the developer is going to be the developer task to have to come up with a new security pattern. Yep. Then essentially, after decoupling these patterns, you are essentially essentially creating shareable libraries, right? I, and I in this case, in, in in this case, you can decouple an authentication and authorization a shareable library through a policy, right? Perfect. So now the developer doesn't can don't ha doesn't have to come up with all this, and then he can really focus on the business value that he's going to be exposing through an API. Yeah, we love creativity, but not when it comes to security, right? We, we that is to, correct. Uh, we, you want should. To, we want to build best practice and standardize. Exactly. So, and remember, uh, security is not all about uh, just authentication and authorization. Perhaps you want to protect your APIs against uh, DDoS attacks or perhaps against content-based attacks. That's something that, again, is, is great that you're thinking of the, on those uh, different issues. However, you just need to have to come up with those uh, patterns once, and, uh, and perhaps you're... Uh, the, the person in, in charge of design or designing or identifying those patterns is a completely different a stakeholder uh, than from a developer from a the developer standpoint, right? Mm -hmm. Perhaps in your own organization, you already have a security team that is in charge of the, making sure these uh, patterns are applied are applied uh, correctly throughout all the APIs that you're going to be exposing. So you you will need to have the right tool that it will enable you to have this separation of duties, right? The developer team, the API team, will focus on the real business value through that are going to be exposed in through, through APIs and of course the security stakeholders are going to treat these shared security policies as a, a non-functional requirement right although yes. they are very important you just need to come up come up with them once and then you don't have to worry about them you can keep redeploying new APIs and you don't you don't need to do the, all the revalidation process for these specific aspects of your releases right so it's almost like the path of least resistance if I'm a developer and I'm creating APIs, I mean, I'm, you're actually making my life a little easier, right? I just got to focus on the request and response of the payload and the business logic there. 
But all the stuff around the shared security policies is no longer a thing that I have to be concerned with. I, if I deploy on the API platform, I'm automatically getting some of these policies for, for free. They're added already, right? That is correct. And it's still, you, you, you might want to have the right tool just because you will still want to have certain level of flexibility. Perhaps you, uh, you're going to come, come up with the specific uh, parameters that are going to be able to uh, uh, let the API team to decide which uh, uh, rate quotas, the rate or quotas you're going to be applying per API or API product. So again, mm -hmm. You still want to have that separation of concerns in regards of policy enforcement. However, there are certain levels of uh, parameter, uh, pra parameterizing options you might want to leave uh, 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 to be the responsibility of the API team or even a business team. Nice, nice. So I get that flexibility. And I also, you know, anybody who uses the platform says, hey, security has already been involved. They've actually been part of the architecture of the policies even that are being added, which is really great. Remember, we're talking about um, artifacts here. So every software uh, product nowadays have to go through a software development life cycle. And the best way to do uh, all these releases is through an agile process, right? So. Yeah. In, in thinking in terms of an API platform and uh, everything that you're going to be deploying within this tool, we're thinking in uh, configuration terms. So usually we have to train these configuration artifacts as if as if they were any other software uh, uh, artifact, right? So they're going to have a a, a a release process. They're going to have a they're going to have specific stages where you might want to run some quality uh, quality checks and uh, and you're going to you and you're going to want to make sure that you're applying and 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 making making sure the, sec the right security uh, uh, policies are being enforced even before deploying this configuration into the platform, right? Mm -hmm. After, the, after the, these configuration artifacts are deployed into the platform, you want to make sure that even though they already they they were already pre-validated, once you deploy them, then you you can rerun some tests uh, to be able to uh, to uh, comp uh, to have a full integration test results uh, from your from the consumer side all the way to the, your backend system. So again, you will have even uh, multiple security. These uh, kind of life cycles will enable you to have multiple security checks uh, checks before deploying and even after deploying. Nice. So there's a lot of tools in the CI CD pipeline that you're talking about, right? Yeah, definitely. And the beauty of it is that uh, each, every customer is different. And as well, every customer might be in a different stage in, in, in regards of, mat of the maturity level uh, on, on using sober, uh, agile software development life cycles and pipelines. Yeah. So, uh, so most organizations want to be able to reuse what they already got. Right, mm -hmm. uh, you don't want to get a platform that is going to force you to choose a specific set of tools. Right, you want to have flexibility. So, and that's great from a developer standpoint. Right, you don't need to rethink the wheel. If you're already used to uh, to handle Java source code, most likely you're going to be relating very often to Maven. Right, so you might want to you might want to uh, uh, to have an option for you to be able to deploy configuration artifacts through Maven. So that's something that Apigee provides for our customers. So uh, another thing, if you're uh, perhaps a web developer, you might be more comfortable using JavaScript-based tools. So also uh, Apigee offers some plugins for you to be able to deploy configuration artifacts into the, into the platform using JavaScript plugins. And uh, again, the sky is the limit. Uh, if, you're, you're already, if you're already using an, a CI CD orchestrator, uh, orchestrator or, such as Jenkins, that's something that you can reuse and build a, uh, a pipeline for all these artifacts that you're going to be pushing into the platform. Thinking about uh, source control, each and every major organization that handles uh, software development, of course, they might have chosen a specific version of uh, or a specific product for um, for source control. So that's something that is really standard in the industry. And actually, we promote it as a best practice also for our configuration artifacts. So Apigee is really flexible, right? We can, we can adapt to all these tools. I think that back to the security point is we see a lot of companies who are using and adding like linting tools, they're adding their uh, security testing tools, they're adding custom like regular expressions and other types of quality checks right into the CI CD pipeline, right? So when they're deploying their APIs to this CI CD process, it's actually going through additional checks, both security, compliance, and any other kind of, you know, standards that they're trying to cover, right? That's exactly. sort of the power of the CI CD is that you know, they're mastering and they're automating it through this deployment process. That is correct. Yeah. So what happens about, uh, you know, now that I'm live, like what can we do about monitoring? So once, is it, uh, once your APIs are exposed to the public, of course, you might want to still uh, be able to monitor 
to monitor what's going on within your API program, right? You want to be able to address specific uh, threats uh, or or even malicious users that might be, um, well, trying to uh, break your existing systems or got, trying to steal your information, right? So yeah. with, you want to have a platform that is going to be able to, uh, that is, that is will, will allow you to define monitoring alerts, right? And then for you to be able to investigate what's going on into the platform in real time and act upon it, right? So yeah. this is something that is pivotal to for for any kind of uh, uh, any kind of platform, and of course, it's very important for an uh, for a platform that is going to be sitting right in the middle within your API consumers and your backend systems. Yeah, sounds like a really good tool to have, especially when I have thousands of APIs or hundreds, and I really don't know kind of like how they're how much protection I have, and uh, if people have been deploying in the past and I haven't been able to manage them, this is a great way to monitor. So let's take a look at um you know let's take a look at some of these things in action. So Ruben's going to open up Apigee. We're going to take a look at when we talk about enterprise policies and how we're securing them and, and reusing them. Ruben's going to show that. We're going to show you the developer experience, which is you know from a developer standpoint, how does that look like? And then we just talked about monitoring security. So let's take a look at those dashboards that are coming out of the box uh, from Apigee. So uh, let's let's get this going and let's take a look at uh, the demo. The first time you're going to be logging into the platform, this is the screen that you're going to see. Okay, uh, the APG Edge platform is in, within the APG Edge platform. Essentially, you're going to be deploying configuration artifacts, right? Uh, mm -hmm. Today, we're going to be showing uh, two different configuration artifacts. We're going to be showing API proxies and also share flows. Okay, mm -hmm. so let's get going. So I'm going to click over here in API proxies. Over here, each and every of these entries that you see on the screen, it represents an API proxy. An API proxy essentially is a configuration artifact that uh, will allow you to augment the capabilities of the endpoints that you're exposing through the platform. Uh, some kind of uh, some examples of these augmentation capabilities. Perhaps you're thinking of the forces security patterns. Perhaps some lightweight mediation. Perhaps some traffic management. Those are the uh, kind of patterns that you're going to be decoupling from your backend systems, and you want to enforce them within the platform. Okay. Mm -hmm. So I already prepared some APIs beforehand. Okay. So we have some zip codes, payment, employees APIs. So I'm going to get going. I'm going to start uh, getting into the zip codes API. Okay. All right. So once I get in, I'm going to switch into the develop tab. So as you can see, this is a pretty straightforward API. We have two different endpoints uh, exposed through, uh, through my API, OK, zip codes and cities. OK, so now let's try it out. Nice. Always so, want to make some zip codes. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Uh, within the platform, uh, you have, a, a, uh, well, from a develop, uh, API developer perspective, you will have the trace tool. The trace tool will enable you to enable you to uh, have a, a memory picture of what's going on within the traffic uh, within the traffic flow of your API. So the only thing that, it, that I need to do is to start a trace session. OK? Once it's started, I can send over a transaction. OK? I'm going to hit send. And immediately, I'm getting a 401. So oh. as you can see, I'm, a, I'm, I'm, I'm enforcing two different, uh, two different policies. One of them is a DDoS protection uh, policy. And the second one is a verify API key policy. But wait a minute. If I go back to my uh, develop uh, tab, I don't see any policy being enforced in my flows. I see a, if I take a look into the preflow, I, I see no policy. If I get into the cities uh, resource, I see no policy. I have a policy defined here, but however, this little broken link image here is telling me that it's not attaching to my flow. So what's going on? Who's enforcing those APIs? Well, uh, me as a develop as an API developer within my organization, I only have this development view for my API. However, someone up in the chain of command within my organization is already enforcing security policies globally. Let's take a look at that. So now I'm going to switch roles. And now I'm, I'm going to become Ruben Gonzalez, the security stakeholder, right? Me, as a security stakeholder, I will have access to a different configura configuration artifact called SureFlows. OK, so over here within SureFlows, I already have one that is defined as SureFlow Enterprise Security. So let's take a look at it. OK, within the SureFlows, I also have a develop that. So you should you should think of share flows as shareable libraries. Essentially, you're going to be coming up with patterns, and and, and these patterns are uh, essentially uh, uh, policies that are attached together, right? Within an execution flow. So you in this case, I have a single flow, and this is the policies I already have uh, pre-attached. Okay. So as you can see, well, 
we call it enterprise security because mostly all these policies are going to be addressing security uh, scenarios, right? Mm -hmm. So in this case, this first policy is making sure that uh, uh, our backends are, are going to be protected against DDoS attacks. And we are allowing a rate of 100 transactions per second, right? Within the second policy, I'm uh, I'm enforcing a very simple um, authentication mechanism, which is verif verify API key, right? However, mm -hmm. uh, uh, app, the APGH platform is not limited to this simple security pattern. Actually, remember, uh, we offer multiple security policies. So let's take a look at those uh, at that category. Okay. So if I click over here in Add Policy, I'm gonna take. A, I, I'm, you're gonna be able to see the three main categories uh, for our out of the box policies. So if we take a look at the security policies, you're gonna be able to see. Well, there are multiple ones, right? And um, and within the platform, let's say if you're interested in using a token-based mechanism to uh, to authenticate each and every API call, of course you can. Within the platform, you can use JWT JWT tokens, JWT tokens. Uh, you can use uh, SAML assertions, for example. Uh, you can use encrypted tokens. You can use basic authentication. Um, if you're looking forward to enforce uh, OAuth across the world, of course you can do that as well. Okay, so there are multiple options within the platform, and of course, uh, there's a lot of flexibility for you to choose and enforce the right pattern depending on your business. Okay, nice, awesome. So again, there are multiple ones. Uh, remember, security is not about just authorization of the on, on authentication. Perhaps you may also want to restrict uh, or and protect your backend systems against content-based attacks. So and these two policies, uh, these two next policies address exactly that. So this first one uh, protects your backend systems against uh, SQL injection attacks. And this second one is protecting your backend systems against uh, uh, um, um, code injection attacks. Nice. Makes sense. So now that I, uh, me as a security stakeholder, uh, define this shared function uh, within my organization, then there's an extra way I can make sure that it, no one can do anything about it and it's going to be enforced globally. And for that, we're going to be using our global environment configuration, right? And within our environments, we're going to have what we call flow hooks. So there are three main flow hooks uh, in, an, in, an, in an environment within an, within an app GH organization, right? So essentially, flow hooks are execution points uh, for the interactions between the API consumer and the platform, and of course, the platform and the backend systems. But these execution points are exactly at the edges, meaning the developer will not be able to touch these edges, right? This is, this is, these are policies and sections that are enforced globally. OK, so I'm going to switch environment here. I'm going to switch from, to my development environment. And as you can see, well, here it is. My global enterprise security policy is being enforced at the pre-proxy. The pre-proxy flow hooks is guaranteed to execute before the transaction reaches your API proxy. Therefore, the API, uh, the API developer will, uh, well, will not be able to uh, manage or to change this setting. Nice. So any API deployed to the test environment is going to go through these enterprise security policy that you just said in the pre proxy, right? That is correct. That, and I don't have to do anything as a developer to do that, which is, I think, a big difference from big G governance where you give them, give somebody a document or you say, this is a process and we're going to check. There's nothing here, right? You deploy, it'll automatically happen. Exactly. Uh, now the developer is going to be able to focus on really defining a nice uh, RESTful contract for the APIs. Yeah. And now they're going to be able to expose those APIs in a very uh, nice way. And they don't have to worry and to come up or to get to create it with a security pattern. Yeah, perfect. And I see you also have a uh, post flow there too. So that means like if you have a logging policy or any other things that you want to do after you get the response back, you know, we see a lot in the post target as well, right? Now we know that uh, our security stakeholder, me as Ruben Gonzalez as a security stakeholder, I'm able to import these kind of policies globally. Now, now that you can, now you're going to be able also to deploy uh, new APIs without, have, without having to uh, worry about all these security patterns. Now let's take a look at, uh, at our monitoring dashboard. So within the platform, remember, you will have the ability to set up some rules and for you to be able to validate and make sure that you're going to be able to monitor and investigate specific security scenarios that you're, that me as a stakeholder, I'm going to be interested in. Okay. So let's take a look our, to our API monitoring dashboard. So over here, you're going to be able to define your own um, alerts, right? And these alerts are, are based on metadata that is captured by the platform in real time for each and every transaction that is going through, 
okay so let's take a look our uh to our alerts that we already predefined okay so now a common use case for a secure stakeholder is going to be well i'm going to be interested in uh, failed authentication attempts i'm going to make sure that well i'm not being attacked or my um or a, or a malicious user is not trying to overwhelm my um my authorization services right so in this case I'm going to create a new alert. In this case, this alert is going to be called unauthorized access. OK, it's going to deploy, be deployed in the test environment. OK, and I'm going to set up some conditions. So initially, we're going to set up a basic metric, which is going to be the status code. And as a, me as a secure stakeholder, I'm going to be very interested in 401s because that those uh, this error relates to unauthorized access. Right now, let's define a threshold. In this case, I'm going to define the threshold as a count, and I'm not. I'm only going to allow ten unauthorized attempts uh, every five minutes. Okay. I'm going to add an extra dimension. Okay. In this case, I'm going to select the proxy API proxies as my dimension. Right, and this uh, condition is going to be applied to all um, available API proxies within an environment. Remember. Um, ultimately, the API platform sits sits on top of your all your existing backend system. Doesn't matter where the where where they are deployed, right? So you want the right tool for you to be able to manage these flexible and uh, deployments, right? In this case, I'm able to uh, to scope down uh, conditions to the to the API level. However, this uh, condition is a global. Uh, I'm sorry, this uh, filter is a global uh, is a global one that is going to be applied uh, throughout all the available APIs in the environment, right? And also. Is going to be applied throughout all available regions within my organization. Remember, you want the solution that can be uh, deployed in multiple environments. Okay, so now now that I set up my conditions, I'm going to be able to create notification channels. Okay, within my alert, uh, within my alert, uh, I can define multiple notification channels. In this case, we support four. Uh, uh, ma uh, main uh, channels, which is going to be email, Slack, per, um, and this is a very common tool that nowadays uh, DevOps teams use all the time. Um, if you already have your duty, you can integrate that very easily. Or even if you have a, uh, a completely different setup of, or custom setup for you to be able to be notified, of course, we can integrate uh, to that using a webhook. OK, awesome. so as you can see, Ray, this is a, there's a lot of flexibility how not only ops teams, but also security, uh, but also security stakeholders are going to be able to monitor specific patterns and react uh, accordingly in real time. Nice. So it's a kind of a nice rules engine to find out issues and uh, proactively uh, notify. It's great. Exactly. What about from a security standpoint? You mentioned the security dashboards and looking at policies and seeing if APIs were adhering to that. Yeah, if, remember we discussed multiple approaches. Uh, we we mentioned security from a, from a design standpoint, from a non-functional requirement standpoint. We also talked about automation, how you can perform uh, a specific checks even before deploying your API proxy configuration. But now let's talk about once your APIs are deployed, then how do you make sure that you're going to be able to audit uh, what's going on in the uh, in the API proxies that your developers are deploying into the platform? Um, and for that, we're going to be using our security reporting capabilities. Okay, mm -hmm. let's take a look at, to our configuration dashboard. So over here, this is a single view of uh, which policies are being enforced or used within an environment. Okay, in this case, I'm going to switch to the test environment. Actually, I already have another environment prepared for you guys because this this one will have way more APIs than the ones that we were. Oh, there's on. a lot here. Okay. Yeah. Exactly. So in this case, as you can see, um, this is a single point of view of what's going on on each and every API that is being deployed. OK, mm -hmm. so in this case, I'm able to see if uh, these APIs are receiving traffic from a secure uh, so from a secure virtual host, meaning all the traffic is being encrypted or not. OK, um, also in this case, you're going to see multiple uh, um, uh, policies, uh, policies categories that are being applied uh, uh, or used within an API uh, proxy. In this case, if I click on the Istio auth proxy, I'm making sure that, well, a specific uh, security policies are being enforced. Also, 
uh, remember, security is not about authentication and authorization, but also about making sure that, well, if someone is deploying some custom code within your API proxy configuration, you want to make sure that, well, this developer is not using any strange uh, uh, JavaScript libraries. For, for instance, right? So you want to make sure that security checks were enforced even the, even before deploying, and once deployed, that nothing has not that nothing has changed. Hmm. Okay. So this is pretty cool. So if I look at all this, I can just by looking at it say bo authentication and this consents API. You know, there's no po security policies there against those. That is correct, and that's a, a big no-no. If me as a security stakeholder, I would say, yeah. well, what went, what went wrong? Who green-lighted the deployment of, of that proxy? What's going on? <laughs> I'm uh, yeah, let's go, I, let's go figure that out. Nice. So this is really kind of a nice comprehensive view. It's really sort of a bird's eye view of all the APIs and what security policies they're using. That's awesome, Ruben. Thank you. With all that information that we saw, so we saw the enterprise policies being enforced automatically. We understood a little bit about uh, the API platform. And we talked about where we can apply rules and automation into all of this. So let's take a look back at our use case. So we've got our API team. They're really happy. Uh, but they're, they're about to be unhappy because they're going to hit all these speed bumps, right? These big four speed bumps that we have here. So if we used our automation, our governance 2.0 um, approach, and we use this API management function, what would happen? So let's take the first step, architecture review. I would say, Ruben, that we don't need an architecture review at this point, right? If we already stood up Apigee, we've got API management platform, I would say the architecture reviews happen. We've stood up the API management platform. Any new API doesn't have to do another review. That is correct. So now uh, remember, and the whole point of it is for you to go to the couple of these patterns and apply them globally. Perfect. So that saves us a lot of time for the API team. So they're still happy at this point. What about on API design? So if I go to API design and I'm already putting in the policies, or actually I didn't have to, if I'm already deploying APIs, and the policies are being automatically enforced through those flow hooks that you showed us. Security has already signed off. I mean, at this point, the only other thing is really around my payload, right? So I, I would say at this point, anything that I've deployed is already built in at runtime. So again, I have saved some time there as well on the API design front. Right? That is correct. Even before, before, before deploying and even after deploying, you can make sure that nothing is going to go on even through automation or through the tool. Nice. OK, and then uh, I'm about to do you know, a pull request. Uh, I have uh, my tech leads going to take a look at you know, my code. You know, good news is if I deploy in this new governance 2.0, and if we put in LinkedIn tools, we've actually done other security call outs to something like a check marks or something, or any other kind of uh, regular expressions, you know, I'd say at this point, for internal standards review, I've already automated it per build. Right? So as a developer, I know kind of what I'm going to be tested against. I can run it, you know, during my build time, and I can see the results. So again, I would say, Ruben, you know, I'm going to put an X here. We don't have to hit that speed bump anyway anymore for the internal standards review as well. What do you think? Exactly. Again, uh, through, uh, through either through a tool or, or automation, you can make sure that well you're working with the right, right with the right patterns, and you're going to be able to see the reports. Nice. So my rework cycle has already gone down by a lot. So what about the last one? I'm going to hit this uh, deployment. I'm talking to the ops teams. You know, certainly, I think you know, given given most companies and organizations we worked with, there's probably still a need for somebody to manually hit the button just to make sure things are right. But you know, from essentially providing the information and generating the report about what's been done, I would say that you know we can generate these results automatically and get them to the ops folks so that they can do a final approval. So maybe not a full two slashes, but I would say we probably cut that time down in about half or even more by auto-generating for ops and getting that final approval on the deployment. So what, yeah, do you, what would you say to that? Ruben? Yeah, it might change depending on the industry. There are some folks out there that might be uh, have, may, might be used to have many, many more checks before deploying something into production. Perhaps uh, if you are into financial industry, perhaps you're going to have way more stages, even even the ones even the ones that we already covered here today. Mm -hmm. So it changes a lot, and also changes depending on the level of the maturity level for uh, for your DevOps teams. Yeah, yeah, it certainly changes. But I think in general, you know, what we see here is that you're reducing a lot of that effort that a lot of teams have already had to incur because of the way governance was set up before, right? So with these modern tools, you know, we've totally been able to launch a lot faster. And I think the best part is 
most of this is built into the process, right? So the design is built in, the quality, the security, and the testing is built into the development lifecycle rather at the end, you know? That's, that's the part that is also saving us a ton of rework and ton of wasted time uh, that's been happening in the past. Let's recap, Ruben, let's take a look. What would be the, let's take a look at the key takeaways for APIs. So you've got hundreds of APIs, maybe thousands, and you've got to deliver them at speed, scale, and quality. You know, what's the top things that you need to consider? Number one is shift your thinking. API governance 2.0 is about a center of enablement, not a center of excellence. You are not in command and control. You are you're there to enable and empower the API teams within the lines of business, within your enterprise to go faster and you help them get there with real quality tools. The second is architect security upfront with an API management platform, something like Apigee. When we build uh, APIs, when we build that management uh, platform with the API, uh, with Apigee, we're working with security. You've got security involved in the design of the architecture that ensures a trusted uh, platform set up from day one. The third, and what Ruben has showed you around centralizing those security policies, you know, you no longer have to make it an obligation for every developer to do these things. Now you can centralize, that creates a separation of concern let security in, let them be part of the enforcement of these policies. And not only is it about setting the policy, it's about including them at runtime. You actually don't have to give anybody documents. Anytime you deploy an API, automatically built into the runtime. That's a real powerful governance enforcement right there. And it also makes the lives of the developers easy because they don't have to worry about it. You know, that's a nice check there. So uh, what's the fourth one? Standardize the inclusion of enterprise policies. So whenever you started to create these secure policies and you standardize them, you're also looking at ways on how to automatically produce more uh, policies that might protect the, the company from other things. So it's not just about security, but it's also about um, you know, SQL injections or threats or quotas or traffic management policies that might be important to include at an enterprise level. So look for ways to standardize more of that and reduce the developer load. And then last of all, you know, there was a lots of tools that Apigee can work with, automate your QA and your compliance. So include that, that's really sort of that last mile in terms of development, you know, get build quality into your pipeline, use the CICD, automate it, and include standards and compliance checks in your CICD pipeline. So with all of that, I think, um, you know, we've, we've kind of captured some of the key ways for teams that we've seen uh, produce APIs at speed, scale and quality. That's really following the governance 2.0 method and leveraging the Apigee management platform. If you're interested in all of this, um, I would invite you to get started. Uh, if you're already an Apigee customer, just visit and take a look at our docs page. We'll post this up in our resources. And if you're new to Apigee, you can get started right away with a free trial of Apigee Edge. Uh, just follow that link um, and see how easy it is. I mean, you saw Ruben use the tool, you see him some of it's like, you know, essentially using drag and drop features. And we have APIs from Apigee that allow you to do a lot of that, you know, from your IDE or other applications that you're using. So it's a really easy and quick start. So with that, let's, uh, we're getting close to the end of our webinar session. I I'd like to take a look and see if uh, any questions that we have out there from the audience to answer. And let me take a look. And yeah, we have a couple. So let's get started. What are the first question? What types of roles and skill sets are needed to develop this level of automation? Hmm, I would say that it varies a lot, uh, depending on the maturity level within a developer team. So if you're already uh, leaning towards uh, agile software development life cycles and already looking into automation and building a pipeline for your uh, software artifacts, then moving into uh, uh, this approach of deploying configuration artifacts into the, into the platform is, is going to be very easy because you're going to be able to reuse what, whatever you already have. However, if you're just starting getting to know uh, uh, agile software development life cycles, then you can adopt something very simple, uh, very easily within the platform, right? Just because we're talking about configuration, is going to be be way to, to way easier to understand and set up from the uh, from zero. Perfect, perfect. Okay, thank you. And then let's take a look at the next question we've got. Um, this is a good one. I think uh, I was thinking this too as we start. My company has several different businesses and they have different types of security, regulatory, and compliance requirements. Can I really make one global set of policies? What do you think, Ruben? 
Oh, you can definitely do. However, depending on the size of your organization, you might have to come up with multiple security patterns. Remember, uh, and it all comes down to uh, what, what, what you just said, right? Uh, what kind of requirements you're getting and how you're going to be enforcing them. So yeah, yeah, definitely you can define global patterns. However, uh, you might still want to have that separation of uh, duties, that separation of concerns so that um, the developer doesn't have to worry about those patterns. And then someone is going to be able to uh, to enforce those patterns globally. It doesn't it, it, that that someone might be related to a business unit, to a project, not essentially global at the whole organization, depending on the size of the organization, of course. Mm -hmm. And so with shared flows, you know, you can create those reusable, but you don't have to enforce it globally. You can make them easy for teams to add as well. And there's a lot of flexibility and in, in instantiate different exactly. variables into policies. Exactly. You can either give the option to developers to actually enforce that policy if you want to and do some checks before deployment, or you can enforce them globally. Again, there are different ways to do it, but the, the, the beauty of the AppGS platform is that, that you do have those options. You will, you can build your own custom way of, of, of enforcing these policies and onboarding new developers so that they can they understand how they are being applied. Mm -hmm. Okay, great. I see another question here. Um, I think we've uh, kind of covered it, but I think it's a really good question just to reinforce again. The question is, does Apogee provide any tools for CICD code quality or test automation? So yeah, remember, e everything that you saw today in the demo, everything from the clicks I did from the uh, uh, developer view, everything there's an API behind it. So the AppJS platform has been built for, the, for it to be extensible, right? So uh, our customers use Maven plugins for them to be able to deploy uh, configuration artifacts. They use JavaScript tools uh, uh, to deploy and also to test uh, um, custom code that they, they deploy within the platform. So uh, out there, you, you will have multiple options. And of course, we also have one, a very strong community of developers, right? All our, all our customers are, uh, are always engaging with us and also setting up some questions in our APG community. And of course, there's a lot of uh, knowledge out there, said that, and a lot, and a lot of open, a lot of uh, open and open source solutions that even even between customers, they, they start sharing and reuse and contributing. Perfect. That's a, that's certainly a broad community to leverage within APG and outside. Um, so number four, uh, in terms of the question, how big is the center of enablement team? Um, first of all, thank you for using that language and starting to think about that. Um, center of enablement team we see varies, but we, we generally see you know a small group within the central team focused on evangelism, setting standards, and coaching and supporting others. We're looking at probably a handful of people um, in terms of the center of enablement. From there, we see it varying in terms of how many you know API teams you're supporting. If you've got you know ten or hundred hundreds of API teams, obviously your center of enable is probably going to have to scale up, but over time, right? So I don't think this is about creating a big team. Um, it's really can create a central team to set the standards and start to coach and enable other teams to grow quickly. Um, and there's a I think this is the last question we've gotten. It's a it's a great. Uh, question to end with. Uh, the question is, do I need a dedicated security person on the API governance team? What do you think, Ruben? <laughs> That's a very interesting question. Most likely, there's someone within your organization, and you're going to get to meet him once you try to deploy something into production. Right? <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, most likely. Mo and, and again, this varies as well on, uh, on the size of our organizations. However, uh, sometimes if, you, if your team is, way, is too small or organization is too small, then most likely the developer will share that responsibility. However, the best practice is, of course, from a security standpoint, to have that separate those separation of duties, right? So that then someone has can focus only in the, in the right security patterns, and the developers can focus on the real bus business value that you want to expose. Yeah, yeah. And so if we have that separation of concerns, I'd say when you start out with setting up your API management platform, you know, this is the perfect time to invite the security person to the table, right? Let's not meet them at the very end, like Ruben said. You know, I think uh, let's make friends from the very beginning and uh, have security at the table designing and architecting the platform with us together and then build those policies and the approach and quality uh, into the platform and into basically every API that gets deployed. And uh, so with that, I think um, that's, that's, that's the end of our webcast. I uh, hope you guys got a lot out of this, uh, this webcast. And thank you all for taking the time and joining with uh, Ruben and I today. Thank you all. Thank you all, guys.